So welcome everyone to GADMAC 2021, the Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Um, and we welcome Professor Elan Kelman from the University College London, um, who's based in the UK. He has also got, he also has some other affiliations with other universities, I think in Norway off memory. Um, his presentation, Animals and Habitats and Disaster Related Activities. Um, and before we start, here are some basic housekeeping. So you'll find that there is a, the chat is open for this panel. Um, Elan has uh, opted to have the, uh, the chat open. And um, so just bear in mind that if, if you are using the chat, um, all the other attendees can see what you're writing. We also still have the Q&A box available. So if there's questions, we prefer you to use that um, for any questions that you may have um, of Elan. At the end of the session, as you exit, you'll be invited to participate in a online survey and we encourage you to do that. If you're using social media, you can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. And we encourage you to use the hashtag, hashtag G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F. And just like our other presentations, um, the session will be recorded, but it won't be available until we've done some editing and we make it available in July at our GADMAC awards ceremony. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Elon Kalman to talk to you about animals and habitats and disaster related activities. Elon. Well, thank you so much. I mean, what a wonderful opportunity, really making superb use of the online environment and the online approaches to conferences. So just so delighted to be able to participate. Thank you very much for joining. I'm looking forward to many other ways of connecting. So in the chat, I have just put my social media contacts and this is how we do it. This is what we need. And it very much helps us to learn from each other, to support each other and really go forward on this important topic, which again, Steve and the committee have led. And we know how, how relevant it is, particularly from the other presentations in this conference. And so in a sense, this is why we're here. But we're also aware of the major gaps and the major challenges that we face in this field, which is why I've decided to try and get an overview, you know, mainly for myself, because many of the people here actually know this already and are the experts, in order to try and understand what are the different types of animals relevant to disaster issues. So I simply came up with sort of a first order framework, a zeroth order framework, and the presentation is going to be going through these five categories and also thinking beyond. So the first category, companion animals, basically pets. We are aware that so many disaster shelters are not ready to deal with companion animals. So people are turned away from them or they feel that they have to manage on their own simply because their non-human family member is not permitted to enter due to lack of interest, lack of preparedness, lack of facilities. We know from the research that people evacuating without their pets frequently put themselves in danger to try to go back for their companion animal. And certainly if companion animals do die in the disaster, then that tends to impede recovery of the people who had those animals. Yet permitting the animals into shelters is not really straightforward. People in the shelters have allergies or phobias. Unfortunately, not all companion animals are well trained and they could pose dangers. Many animals have killing potential. So people will keep pythons, poisonous spiders for companions. And we have to be aware of trying to achieve a balance between serving all types of pets, as well as safety for the people and for the other animals. Naturally, there's hygiene issues, keeping fish tanks and bird cages clean, ensuring that there are places for companion animals to have as toilets and having appropriate cleaning, disinfection and hygiene for that. Is the pet who's coming in clean and vaccinated? We don't want to bring in ticks or fleas or other diseases into the disaster shelter. And of course the owners have to be responsible in terms of being able to have evacuated with everything they need. Leashes, muzzles, 
cages, bedding, food and water bowls, as well as food. If the animal itself becomes sick or injured, are there even vets with proper equipment available in order to deal with that? Now, these are actually more general points because any animal which we have to deal with in a disaster has these aspects of maybe being poisonous, of safety, of health, of hygiene, of interacting with other animals and people. So some of these general points from companion animals actually apply to other categories, including service animals. Many people with disabilities rely on animals and must have the animals with them at all times. This means that there is a very strong and continuing human animal relationship, which all disaster related activities before disaster, during and after must deal with. Service animals also include those for emotional support, which then leads to an expansion beyond sort of the photo of the standard dogs into other animals, but also discussions over legal stances. And stories abound in the media, particularly regarding trying to bring emotional support animals onto commercial flights. One passenger tried to bring an emotional support peacock on board. Another passenger was denied boarding for their emotional support hamster, so they went to the airport's toilet and flushed the hamster down the airport. Uh, excuse me, and flushed the hamster down the toilet. There are also too many cases of emotional support dogs actually attacking and severely injuring other passengers. Service animals, though, are much wider than providing access and functional needs to people with disabilities, much wider than simply emotional support. So there's a whole long list of categories of service animals in science policy and practice, and they include explosive detection and drug detection food detection for incoming passengers for which New Zealand is very much a leader in this field, search and rescue animals, apprehending criminal suspects, all sorts of military, police, security, guard uses, either private or public, using different types of animals. Definitely using animals for hunting as services. There are sports, whether it's racing or showing and also herding. Some of these roles overlap with companion animals because there are these sort of blurry standards and different legal approaches to what qualifies for particularly an emotional support animal. But when used for sports, hunting or herding, these categories of service animals over, also overlap with livelihood animals. So we're talking about livestock, cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, turkeys, many other animals used for working in jobs horses, mules, llamas, and alpacas. There are also, of course, again, we, get, we look at the overlap with service animals. So we're talking about guard dogs, we're talking about sheep dogs, herding dogs, plowing animals, and these detection animals for explosive drugs and food and others, they provide services to their owners while also creating the owner's livelihoods or aspects thereof. And we've even seen it during some of the lockdown measures for the pandemic, where police are using dogs to detect human beings who are in cars where they are trying to uh, get around lockdown measures, and yet the dogs are able to sniff out the humans who are sort of in the boot or are otherwise hidden in a vehicle, which also assists with trying to detect human trafficking. Specific examples of livelihood animals being dealt with in disasters. Wildfire planning in Colorado includes evacuation and care for large livelihood, livelihood animals. Many manuals, operational manuals, talk about rescues from water and soft ground because it's so important <clears throat> for rescuers to understand these situations and to be able to deal with different types of fairly large <clears throat> livestock animals and rescue them from mud, from tidal areas, or simply from floods. Drought then comes up because how do we procure enough food and water for large herds or farm animals during times of drought, which then leads to the human history of nomadism and pastoralism, which used to be, many, which used to be common in many regions. And they very much implemented all sorts of disaster risk reduction strategies 
particularly through nomadism and pastoralism in terms of moving large herds to where there were resources, away from places where perhaps resources were limited. But so many changes over decades, particularly governance, have undermined many of these traditional strategies. We're talking about forced sedentary lifestyles, increasing the marketization of herds, fragmenting habitats, partitioning them by international borders, by roads, by railways, by settlements, certainly shifting infrastructure, shifting land management in policy and in practice, completely uh, undermine what many pastoralists and nomadists have been doing and nomads have been doing, and also many counter up, counterproductive aid systems, ranging from how reindeer herders in northern Scandinavia are compensated for attacks on their reindeer, right through to even in the Sahel, how aid packages have tried to help and completely failed to help many of the traditional groups that, uh, pursuing traditional lifestyles. Key challenges with the livelihood animals, particularly livestock, are managing them in any situation when food and water are scarce, or if the owners are evacuated and simply cannot get back to their farm or cannot, cannot get back to their free roaming herd in order to support them during these times. Certainly, people will say, well, insure them, which is fair enough, and it is certainly a disaster-related uh, strategy, but then this assumes that the animals die and the owners might not always want that. Another strategy which is used, for example, for cyclones in Bangladesh, is simply set the animals free. And then hopefully be able to, hopefully they will survive and then hopefully uh, gather them up afterwards. Otherwise, it really is about thinking about people and animals, livelihood animals together in evacuation plans. Also, some people, for example, have said, well, what we can do is get the people out of the danger zone, hope the animals survive, and then permit people to enter the danger zone uh, during safe times or during daylight hours in order to care for their animals. And this was done in Montserrat during the volcanic eruption over the last generation, and also in Japan in 2011 after the nuclear power plant disaster. But animals are not necessarily sort of free or partially free. They're not necessarily there for livelihoods. They can simply be there for our other recreational needs, our other interests, as in captive animals zoos, animal parks, enclosed safaris, aquaria, even marine parks, pet stores and research facilities. In this photo, it's the lizard, which is a captive animal, just to clarify that. And we are certainly aware that limited investigation has been completed for disaster related activities for captive animals. But certainly site specific operational procedures exist. So it would be surprising to have any sort of zoo or animal park or research facility or pet store which did not obey the specific building regulations, whether it's respect to fire or with respect to other security, health and safety measures. So it will tend to be very site specific rather than understanding overall what it means for captive animals in disaster related activities. There are manuals which provide general lessons for zoos in terms of dealing with disasters. And there was one recent study which looked at disaster related issues for New Delhi's National Zoological Park. Again, research facilities and shops have to obey their local regulations and also their building regulations. But this does not always mean that animal safety and welfare has been fully considered. When we had the first lockdown related measures last year, Many research animals simply had to be killed, completely wiping out some labs because they could not be taken care of in the sudden lockdown and there were few contingency measures for them. Other areas which really lack a lot of understanding, a lot of operations is a fifth category of simply wild animals, wild lands. Society and nature we know are inextricably intertwined. They always have been. Accepting a disaster as affecting only human beings or only society without the environment might not really be sensible and is a potential limitation in all of the disaster discussions which we have. Similarly, the delineation between wildlife or wild animals and those in the other four categories is not always strictly determined. 
because any animal retains some level of instincts and behavior, no matter how sort of domesticated they are or how much our bond is. And not all wild animals are necessarily wildlife. So if you just stroll around Istanbul, you see all of these free roaming cats and dogs, almost all of them are friendly while they're looking for food. And when they find out that you don't have food, then they're less friendly, but no one really owns them. So they are kind of common pets. They are free roaming, but are they really wild? Are they really wildlife? This is really definitional up for discussion. More fundamentally, could wildlife or nature be damaged by an environmental process or phenomenon? Well, extinctions, right, including mass extinction, they're part of nature. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for previous mass extinctions, but they do upend the environment. Before human existence, were mass extinctions a disaster? Or were they part of the nat natural evolution of the planet and of the biota on the planet? Even today, would it be a disaster if an environmental process or phenomenon makes a species extinct? or destroys unique habitat. And in Australia, this is a very much debate. When lightning starts a bushfire, but species are very confined or it's unique habitat, is that simply nature? Is that part of the human influence because we've confined the species to a small area? Or is that really a disaster, a disaster for nature and for our valuing of nature? Another facet is legal rights for non-human entities, primates and rivers have been accorded legal rights in certain jurisdictions. Does these, do these rights include the right to, per, to protection? Do these primates, do these rivers, do others have actually the, the right to be protected from disaster? Well, if they do, imagine an earthquake leads to a landslide, which dams the river. So apparently this is a disaster for the river, which means should humans intervene to break that dam? Does it matter if this landslide related dam occurs in a place where beavers are building dams? Or what about the opposite? Maybe there is a natural dam from a landslide long ago or from a beaver and an earthquake breaks that dam. Does that mean that again, a disaster has happened to the river and so humans should intervene to rebuild that dam? We know that the idea of nature as being static is complete nonsense. But who judges whether environmental changes are positive, and thus perhaps it is disaster risk reduction for the primates or for the rivers, or perhaps environmental changes are negative, and, this po and thus possibly they are a disaster for the environment. Finally, though, if non-human entities have disaster-related rights, and do they also have disaster-related responsibilities, duties, and obligations? We do. We have rights and we have duties. But how would non-human entities with legal rights, again, primates, rivers, others, be forced into fulfilling any of these duties, obligations, or responsibilities? How would we punish them if they fail to enact? their disaster-related duties. I mean, we're not going to kill the monkey. We're not going to pollute the river as punishment. So there are these very challenging ethical, legal, moral, and actually practical issues which emerge when we start to drill down beyond the first order or zeroth order. And when we look at the overlaps of these categories, but also think beyond the categories, think beyond some of the fundamental issues which have emerged. Living entities and their habitats, for instance, are not only affected by disasters, but they can be a fundamental input into a disaster. As we know, disaster risk is hazard and vulnerability. <clears throat> Some of the hazards are from the environment, wind, earthquakes, floods, wildfires. So these abiotic components of wildland, those abiotic components of the environment are labeled as hazards to society. Are they hazards to other animals, to nature? We know, of course, microorganisms cause epidemics, pandemics, that's why we're here. Plants can be problematic, whether they're poisonous or whether it's coconuts falling from trees and killing people, which happens frequently. <clears throat> Plants give us crops. 
is sort of this nature society interaction, which we have to consider in the context of human environment interactions and in dealing with crops. But animals too, such as all those we've been talking about, can be hazardous in their own right. So they become, rather than microbiological hazards, they become macrobiological hazards. So if we're trying to deal with animals, but the animal is a hazard, there's sort of this overlap in terms of different management approaches. So coming back to this definition of disasters affecting human society, we're also aware that animals and their habitats can render external systems, such as search and rescue dogs. Some researchers show that dogs seek help in emergencies and emergencies for the dogs or for the humans. And other animals definitely realize loss. Again, it's been recognized in dogs, it's been documented for elephants, which means that not just humans and society experience disaster, whatever we're calling it, but animals too. And as per some of the earlier discussion, possibly even habitats. But habitats contribute to stopping disasters. You know, we throw about these phrases, ecosystem-based disaster reduction, nature-based solutions, come on. This isn't new, we've been doing this for 10,000 years, if not more. But using nature and the environment to avert disaster raises questions such as, why do we suddenly come up with these technical phrases for what is obvious? But why does the definition of disaster focus on the human element? So biodiversity, ecodiversity, geodiversity, are they traits of the environment? Are they disaster risk reduction measures? Are they disaster creation measures? Are they all of them simultaneously, depending on the context? And then we get into animism and different belief systems, different approaches to what nature means and what nature does. So the framework is here. It's there for improvement. It recognizes that we have to deal with these issues in terms of challenging the notion that for disaster occur, to occur, it must affect people or society. And it raises a questions which have long been in philosophy for centuries about whether nature, animals have intrinsic value, why and what that intrinsic value is. All within the context that, of course, my entire framework in this whole approach is from sort of me, and I'm, I'm kind of a human being, so it really is from that human perspective. We need to continue these philosophical and practical operational discussions to understand how to best deal with animals and habitats and disasters, most fundamentally, so that it helps us deal with ourselves in disasters. Thank you very much. Again, please contact me via social media. I'm looking forward to questions and discussion. Thanks, Ellen. That's an amazing insight. And I know that um, the, the first order hierarchy that you referred to is, is, very, is consistent with um, Leslie Irvine's uh, discussion around uh, socio, socio zoological vulnerability and hierarchy. Um, that's 27 points in Scrapple, I think, that, that uh, combination. Um, but yeah, it's great to see that there's a similar approach. The, the other sort of comment that I would, um, I'm sort of keen to get your thoughts on is, is something that um, one of our conference committee, um, Gerardo Gutierrez, who's based in Costa Rica and who's been heavily involved with organizations like World Animal Protection. And he has a very sort of similar um, philosophy with you as in the, the importance of definitions and you know, from a simplistic point of view, we talk about disasters, disasters when we have a natural hazard uh, system intersecting with a human system, and, and it requires the two to, to create this disaster. But that's very human centric. And when a lot of the definitions that we use, and especially a lot of the definitions that we have seen developed even through, you know, you know, glossaries established by the UN, uh, the the language still doesn't probably directly cover animals and the impacts that they have around livelihoods and connectivity rather than just an economic value impacting on community. So I, I welcome any more, more thoughts you have on, on either of those um, 
comments. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And certainly what I presented, <clears throat> there's really nothing original. I've actually gone to other people's ideas in the literature and said that, hang on, let's try and bring this together because there's so much wonderful work out there, particularly the operational people who are writing textbooks for this. But also the researchers who are saying, no, we have this real problem. Let me talk to the people. Let me look at the animals. Let me work this out. So for in that sense, yeah, I'm, I'm drawing on a lot of people. And even the paper which was submitted for the special issue was a bit, bit embarrassing because the maximum was 4,000 words. So I had to cut out so much work, which is so important and which I drew upon not being able to cite it. So this is where please contact me with and connect and say, but Elan, you forgot this reference. And yeah, I probably did. Or, you know, you, you, there's this textbook, which I probably didn't know about. And this is working together to bring it all uh, to the fore and try to do better as researchers, but also as practitioners. On this aspect of humans, and actually that's so <clears throat> sort of the book which I published last year, uh, Disaster by Choice, trying to bring it up with the background, I think you can see the, the headline there, really started with this premise that a disaster affects society. I was not comfortable with that, but you know, you have to start somewhere. And this is now where I'm thinking, okay, so sure, I published the book Disaster by Choice, hopefully it has some positive influence, but what mistakes did I make? What does it not do? And one of the things it does not go into is this whole conference, which is why it's a privilege to sort of be here. And it really started me thinking again with discussions with uh, Patricia Duda, who's here, and many others who, who may be in the audience, but who've inspired me to say, that's fine. Disasters are about humans, but think beyond that. And again, that's why I sort of said, well, I need to learn. So let me try and create the framework and draw on other people's ideas and really try and think, well, what does nature mean to us in the context of preventing and responding to disasters? What do animals mean to us? And how much really is about assumptions regarding the disaster human link, forgetting about the wider environment? So now Mel has a question. What role does the law legal system play here? It seems like no one will do anything big unless it is a legal requirement. The lack of recognition of animals in their own right seems to be a constant impediment to real change, yes. And I, I think actually probably Mel and you too, Steve, know a lot more about this than me, but it has been interesting reading some of the laws, including rights to non-human entities, and thinking about the fact that we do actually have, you know, a law to say, don't beat up your pet dog. I, how could anyone want to do that in the first place? And laws saying that, if it's a service animal, it has to be permitted on the airplane and in the restaurant. I mean, how could we even think of denying it? So very sadly, laws are needed, but then they have to be monitored and enforced. And this is a challenge that we face when humans think that they are always or inevitably above animals. And when humans think that society and nature are actually separate and it's our duty to exploit nature. So yes, part of it is pushing the laws but also the philosophy to think more integrated and to think about animals are part of us. They are part of our society. Um, I do have a question. Do I know if in strategic plans, authorities make a classification of importance of each category impact on economy? How do manning is rescue? And if such a classification has impacts on rescue steps? And the answer is yes. Well, some do, some don't. It is very contextual. And particularly in these plans, some people say no matter what, human life is more important than animal life, and human life is more important than nature. <clears throat> and for me, certainly when it's my life, I'm not going to disagree, but that's my bias. And I think these are some of the philosophical discussions, which then enter into the practicalities, which we need to explore. Antarctica is an interesting example and that there are very strong and appropriate measures to protect humans forcing interaction with animals in Antarctica. But then people may need rescued, they may, need, uh, they may be in danger, and so that balance has to be achieved. Do you actually go closer to the animal than you're meant to to help the human? Do you do a flyover of a penguin colony to get to that rescue? And this is very much coming into the disaster realm who is important, what is important, who judges. And yes, many authorities from Antarctica to local places have these strategic plans, but they're ongoing. And we need your help, we need your input 
to understand if we are doing it right and how to continue improving. So Elon, you're one of the world's leading scholars around disaster risk reduction. Um, so about that. <laughs> what, what motivated you to get involved in this topic area? Because usually it's, it's usually the other way around. People that are more animal focused get into the animal disaster management more, probably more common than the disaster management people getting into animal uh, side of things. So what, what's, what's been the uh, inspiration or attraction for you to, to um, pick this up? Because it's important that we actually mainstream and normalize a lot of the research in this area, not as a nice to, but this is a core science that we need to advocate and champion. It was really my obvious ignorance. So I didn't know much about it. I realized it was a concern and I felt I had to improve. And there's probably about a dozen people, um, researchers who I found were interested in this topic and had discussions. Um, again, that includes sort of um, one of my PhD students who's on this call, one of my postdocs, or I'd be in, in presentation in conferences and someone went up and presented on evacuating llamas in wildfires in Colorado. And I thought, wow, I would never even think about that. So I just realized I was missing this whole area. Again, then in writing the book, Disaster by Choice, people said, but come on, Elan, your definition of disaster, it's about people and society. And I thought, oh, that's right. And the 40 years of glossaries, which I went through defining disasters and dictionaries also, and thinking across different languages, it was always about human and society. So the inspiration came from all of these other researchers and then I went into the literature and got inspired by them, but it was really motivated by my ignorance. What's really interesting is when I came up with sort of the list of the dozen or so who'd mentioned these issues of animals and nature, uh, almost all of them were women. And so all, when I look at the literature, it's a lot more balanced. So we also have to be thinking again from the human perspective, the gender perspective, who's pushing the agenda, who's motivating it, who is quite rightly telling me I'm making mistakes or missing something, but it also then thinks about whether male animals and female animals respond differently, or do we respond differently to uh, male animals and female animals? And this is again, a whole wide area to think about. But yeah, primarily I just knew nothing about the topic realize its importance and felt, well, I need to learn and hopefully simultaneously make a small contribution. Well, we're very fortunate that you have been inspired to learn more about the topic and indeed uh, be a great champion for the topic across the, the DRR research space. Um, we've got one last, uh, I don't know whether that's yeah, a so comment or commented, just a phrase. Yeah, um, my, my pet hate, which is an interesting pun, is the phrase we always get here, no lives lost when thousands of animals die. It doesn't get more anthropocentric than that. Yeah, and actually that word anthropocentric, which I didn't use, is a very good one. Um, it's sort of that balance, anthropocentric, ecocentric, but why be centric? I mean, we, we deal with disaster risk reduction, response, preparedness, mitigation, uh, readiness, recovery simultaneously as we should. So of course we should deal with ourselves, our society, our built environment, animals and the natural environment and plants simultaneously. So I guess maybe perhaps a discussion point take away, why be so centric? Good point. And I think we've got one last question there. You can probably see that uh, up on the chat there. Oh yeah, so from Veronica, who has also been one of my inspirers and is sort of one of those dozen who I thought, wow, she's doing really interesting work. I can learn from this. So she says, how do we avoid the risks by sticking to categories like these, human-made and human-centered, of reproducing how they are themselves, a hazard for animals, a factor that helps to build their vulnerability to disasters? Well, how do we do it? I don't know. Join me. Um, again, it's your work, Veronica, and it's the others who are not only asking these questions, but answering them and trying to find ways forward. And it is interesting that, uh, you know, I mentioned macrobiological hazards, animals being a hazard to humans, but you're sort of implying quite rightly, humans are a hazard to animals and humans are a hazard to nature. So who is vulnerable? What is vulnerable and why? And thinking about it um, sort of as you're implying, who has the risks, who, create the, who creates the risk? And it absolutely goes in multiple directions 
not just from nature to people and society, but the other way around, which again is sort of the argument for moving away from any sort of centric approach and saying it's human society interaction, sorry, it's human nature interaction, it's society environment interrelationships, and we need to be working together, which overall will not only stop hazards being hazardous, like wind, water, fire, air, uh, soil, but it will also reduce vulnerabilities of ourselves and of nature, but more importantly, of everything, animals, plants, nature, society, buildings, infrastructure, reduce the vulnerability of everything together, also particularly by reducing the hazardousness of many of these abiotic and biotic components. Well, thank you, Professor Kelman, for your humility and also your interest to, to champion this, this, uh, this important theme. And um, it's been great to have you here at GABMAC 2021, and we look forward to you being part of the, the program and, and future GABMACs to come. So thanks for your time today, this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Um, and uh, thank you everyone else for tuning in to, to GADMAC. And we'll be finishing now for day seven. Uh, day eight, we've got 10 days. Day eight, we'll be kicking off with John Moretti and Dr. Norm Rosin uh, from the North Valley Animal Disaster Group. So thanks for everyone for joining us. And again, thank you, Ellen, for your expertise, wisdom, and thoughts. Thank you very much and a pleasure to be here. And again, incredible job you've done with thanks to you and the committee. Our pleasure. Thanks, everyone.